So we can start with the presentations. We have Wanda up first. And basically throughout these presentations, we're just talking about um, either the program that a representative obviously represents and their, some projects that have happened during their residency programs, giving you a little bit more background information either about specific programs or collectively on a whole, the ethos of said organization, or if that person is an artist, selections of work that they have done while in residency, and just with some details and visual demonstrations. So um, I'm here from uh, Boston Center for the Arts, I'm giving myself some feedback. Um, so we, you know, we're, we strive to be a really supportive home for artists of all disciplines. Uh, and we do that in many different ways. We produce, we commission, we curate, we provide space for uh, creation, exhibition, rehearsal, performance, but at the very core of what we do is our artist residencies. And so this is just a little quick um, slide to show you know, our residencies by the numbers. We have two visual arts residencies, one in the fall and one in the spring. We have a public art residency that, that, that usually falls within the realm of visual arts, but actually has been, become increasingly interdisciplinary. Um, that usually happens in the summer. Uh, we have two uh, new dance maker residencies. They are about a year long, but they're concentrated in a um, three-day uh, off-site retreat and six weeks of rehearsal that lead to a showcase. And one music ensemble in residence, this is very new, um, with caliber strings. Uh, we have 10 performing arts company residencies um, that are on campus for about three years, that we have seven uh, theater companies and three dance companies, and then we have three multidisciplinary micro-residencies um, of about five days each. Uh, and uh, we, we also have our artist studios building, which is um, 50, uh, 50 studios, uh, work-only studios uh, on our campus. So we'll just go through uh, these quickly. Um, so uh, Tran Vu is, is our current visual art residence. Uh, um, she's actually doing public <coughs> program this evening uh, with her project Made Elsewhere, uh, in which she's uh, re-envisioning um, re the Statue of Liberty using uh, found and um, borrowed and uh, uh, collected materials. Um, and it really taps into ideas about uh, immigration and, and refugees, as many of our artists are working on. Um, so she's our spring resident, and that's very typical. They, um, they get their own studio for about three or four months. They work on a project. It's very process-oriented. We do ask them to do a public program, but um, tonight's program, Tran, is um, sort of doing a, a little lec demo and a workshop, but it's not, there isn't like a final, ta-da, we really want it to be a process-oriented residency. And so each person um, tackles it differently. Okay, next slide. Um, we have a one public art resident every year, again, usually in the summertime. This past year, we had Lucas Spidey um, with his um, mobile incubate, incubator, which is a 1955 retrofitted uh, Shasta camper that was on our uh, BCA plaza all summer long. And he held you know, informal sessions. He sort of had office hours where artists could come in and talk to him about um, the business of art and how you sustain yourself as an artist. And he has been taking this camper all around the country, talking to artists everywhere about how they live and make their work and survive and thrive and be happy, how they shift, all those kinds of questions. He had some podcasts out of there. We had some tiny camper concerts in there. So it was, um, it was a very unusual and really a vibrant residency. Our Dance Makers residency is um, uh, new this year. We've had, um, for, for 10 years, we've had a choreographer's residency program, and uh, we tried to make it more robust this year, so we partnered with the Boston Dance Alliance to make what we hope is the most comprehensive dance residency in the city. And it is um, uh, three days of retreat with your ensemble, the dance maker and ensemble, or, or collaborators off-site. The idea being that when you're away from the city and the cares of daily life, even for three days, that you can really dig into the work. So they have this three-day uh, retreat, and then they have six weeks, however they want to use it, in our Martin Hall, in one of our dance-oriented spaces, to rehearse, create, <coughs> excuse me, brainstorm, and then have a showing, a showcase. They can have a formal concert, or they can have an informal showing at the end. And so we have two of those over the course of the year. 
Uh, Caliber Springs is our first music ensemble in residence. Uh, this is a real experiment. We've never had um, that much music at Boston Center for the Arts. We do not have spaces that are traditionally um, uh, designed acoustically to support music. So this was a real experiment, um, and it, especially that we have a 14-person uh, musician-led string orchestra um, when we don't have orchestral spaces. Uh, but, they, but part of their mission uh, is to work in non-traditional spaces, so they were a good fit for BCA. Mm -hmm. And another big part of their mission um, is their connection to community, and especially to communities who don't have a lot of access to classical music. So they really, they really did dovetail with our mission, which is not only just for artists, but to connect those artists with community and build, build a whole um, ecosystem mm -hmm. around the, the artists and the community. Um, so they've been here for about a, a year, almost a year, they'll get not even close to a year. They'll be here a year in August, and then they'll have one more year. Um, and they have done a, a large project in the Cyclorama that uh, tapped into the stories and music of three of Boston's immigrant communities, uh, Irish, Chinese, and Cape Verdean. Oh, can we click on this little link? Oh, that's all right. I was going to show you just a little sample of um, the Cape Verdean collaboration um, with Benvindo Cruz. It was really uh, uh, wonderful. Anyway, but I, uh, I can send you that link and you can maybe... Uh, what we can do is anything, like if people are missing something, um, we can always post all this information in the actual event so, mm -hmm. so, 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 so people can uh, find a lot of that there. Yeah. And I would say that's part of, of BCA. We love Oops, um, we love collaborations. Mm -hmm. So you, so Caliber Strings also um, collaborated with one of our visual artists in the artist studio building to create uh, the environment um, that uh, a visual arts installation where people collected stories or could share their stories as part of that concert, mm -hmm. um, as well as collaborating with other musicians. Performing arts companies. Uh, there's so much stuff. I hope it's not getting lost in this sort of breath, breathless uh, zip through BCA. As I said, we have seven theater companies and three dance uh, companies in residence who create and perform in our spaces. This is a shot of Liars and Believers. They work a lot with puppetry and mask um, and inventive performance. Very simple. You can see there's no set other than this giant puppetry. Um, and they too um, will often collaborate with some of our visual artists in their work. Yes? Can you sort of explain the nature of these residencies? Because I'm sort of getting the impression that there might be different types, like if they're in residence for a year or two. They are all, different. that's a really great question. So all of our residencies, because all of the disciplines are different, we really strive to, to make a, a residency that is suited toward the specific discipline and what that specific artist needs. Um, in a perfect world, and to some degree we can do this, we try to tailor it to the specific artist. Um, I would say that we do that really successfully with our visual arts residencies. You know, they, they come to us through a process of a call for proposals, applications, and then a jury. So we really have a very strong sense of who they are as artists, um, their previous work, what they want to do. They're very clear about articulating. We know that it will change. We know that as soon as they get there, it will change, but we want to make sure that we can support them. Visual arts uh, artists get an intern. They're the only artists, uh, our only residents that get their own intern while they're, I know, what a, what a treat, um, <laughs> while they're on campus because we realize that they need that. They need someone they can touch base with every day, whether it's in the helping of creating the work um, or just navigating the administrative aspects. Um, usually when we have, um, a theater company or dance company in, they they come in, you know, with a posse. And so they don't, I mean, I'm sure they would like an intern, but they don't need an intern the way a single artist coming in does that. So a lot of our conversations are who who is the makeup of your company? Some of our dance, uh, our Corey, our dance maker residents come in with um, a lighting designer, you know, or come in with a, with a musician composer. So everyone is different. Um, but in terms of the space, it's a little bit of a balance of how much space we have, how much we can allocate to them, um, and also kind of giving them some, some parameters so that they don't have infinite time and space. Sometimes nothing gets done in infinite time and space. But if you have six weeks, that can really kick you, kick you forward. Right? Um, 
But this is a good segue into um, our micro residencies, run of the mills. This is when we give um, an artist, we put it, usually a collective of artists or a company, we give them uh, the uh, raw mill space, not during an exhibition, but it's raw, it's blank. We give them four to five days. They have a plan. Once again, you know, they've, they've applied, they've given us a proposal, we've talked a lot with them, and they just hit the ground running. And often they make installations, there's performance, there's usually a visual element, a performing element, uh, an acoustic element, uh, video, animation element, there's, there's sort of everything. And it's really um, hard, um, and we probably can't get, uh, there's, a, there's a really great um, interview with um, Jared Williams, who is part of um, Rainbow Collapse, um, Jared and, and Anya, and he, he talks really frankly. You get to see, get to see some of the, the work that they did, but what it means to, like, whoa, you have such a short amount of time, and, and you have this plan, and you have all these people, and you're, you're trying to stay in process, and they did a great job. I mean, there's still going to be a public showing, but the whole point is trying to stay in that place of process the whole time and not be like, I gotta make a, I gotta make a show that people are going to see. Yes, people are going to see it, but it's going to be in a particular state. And they were very, very successful at staying in that like playful, creative mode, which is what we're trying to do with this residency. That said, everyone wants more time. So, you know, in a perfect world, we would create um, a circumstance where someone could be in a space like that for a month. You know, they would have a full month, 24 seven, to really explore and dig around and not feel quite so much pressure. We, we were just curious to see what would come out of that um, interdisciplinary collaboration. And then finally, our artist studios building. Uh, this is the only, this is like Christmas. There's our carolers outside. It's the only picture I could get. Um, it, but, but it is it is a wonderful building. Um, we do have 50 studios, and we have a combination of primarily visual artists, but we have um, a couple of uh, musicians, composers. Nate is one of our uh, ASB uh, studio of uh, artists. Um, we have several theater companies that uh, use it as for their administrative offices or rehearsal space. Um, we, we had City Stage. We have. I mean, we have. A, a number of arts organizations as well as artists and we really try to create a community there and we support them by having quarterly lo small lobby shows in the lobby of that building and then um, every other year we do an ASB exhibition in the Mills Gallery so we do a full exhibition of their work. Okay. Do we do quest questions afterwards? Oh, oh yeah. yeah, we're going to do questions afterwards. Oh, here's, here it is, the Art Studies building. So there's 50, um, it's affordable, but it's, it's really about the community. Um, the way people get into the, the artist studios, they, they don't turn over that quickly, but they do turn over, and every time we have space, we do a call for proposals. Um, again, it's juried, we invite people to help us jury these, and, and we're looking for people who are very engaged um, in their art, um, that they've reached a certain point in their artistic process, but they also want to be part of a community. So it's not a great space for someone who just wants a studio and like just wants to be in there. That's, those spaces are important too, but um, there are 49 other people there, so you have to want to be part of that. Um, and so that's we want to make sure that people do want to connect to that, and you could probably speak to that, Nate, too, because we like have great collaborations come out of that building. Um, for more information, bcaonline.org. That's my direct um, email, and I can pass you on to the program directors for each specific program. So I'm starting with this image. This is from a show at Boston University in the um, former Sherman Gallery. It's now some other kind of space. The gallery closed. Um, but this was an exhibit that was curated by um, uh, Lynn Cooney, uh, who runs the galleries, the director at the at BU. And for this exhibit, um, Unquenchable Thirst, I kind of worked on this body of work over the course of a year. And I attended two artist residencies during that time. The first one was um, uh, Kanak Art Center uh, in Marnay sur Seine. Uh, it's about an hour outside of Paris. Um, and I got a grant from the Tinoche Foundation. Um, and um, Jeanne Yves, uh, is, who's the director there, is very approachable. And in 
if anyone's interested in um, maybe exploring a international residency that is inclusive of, um, I would say, usually they have about 10 people per month. Um, and it's inclusive in terms of they invite musicians some or composers, um, uh, visual artists of all variety, uh, mixed media artists, um, definitely painters. You're definitely in, you know, you're right on the Seine, the river's right there raging, um, and you're in this little village where there's no shops, there's, you know, everything is very bare bones in that sense. Um, so if you want to be immersed in some sort of natural setting uh, with, with other um, makers, it's a really op great opportunity. Um, and also because it's such a small residency, it sort of offers for uh, building close relationships. So while I was there, I made close relationships with a couple people, and we, you know, that was in 2015, and we're still in touch, whether it's over email, um, you know, or in person. So there's definitely opportunities to forge real friendships, and I think, um, you know, artists, we we make we make friends. That's what we do. We more than like having, I don't know, like colleagues or something, right? So that's. I think that's part of the benefit of being in an artist residency and wanting to access some kind of community that's maybe outside of your typical circle. Um, so, and I think that can also help with like the progress of your of your work. So, this particular Im image here was like a crisis piece for me that I made when I was uh, in August. So, I was in um, in uh, at Kanak, um in the month of February. I had this funny schedule, my teaching schedule was different, so I applied to these residencies because I was, had more flexibility um, that particular year. And um, so I was at Kanak in February, and then um, February to March, and then in August at the Vermont Studio Center in Johnson, Vermont. Um, so this particular piece was made in Johnson, Vermont, and it was something that I worked over the course of a whole month. Um, and at the Vermont Studio Center, you have um, visual artists and writers primarily, I would, I would say. Um, one thing that was really incredible that particular year at the Vermont Studio Center, there was, um, there was a group penned themselves the Hive, um, primarily writers, but there were a couple of visual artists, and they just became a tight-knit group during the whole time of uh, working there, you know, just, you know, reading each other's work, uh, you know, spontaneous, you know, studio visits, collaborative um, conversation, just sort of constantly. Um, you know, and then there were like breaks where people would go swimming because it's August, you could just go swimming in the river there. Um, so it was very, you know, playful and open um, and meals were prepared for you so you didn't have to worry about, oh, what am I going to be eating and things like that. So it takes like the, a little bit of the pressure off with that and connect. Lunch was something that we had to prepare, and generally the group of us, we were all kind of foodies, and so we were just very focused on like making nice meals, and they just expected us to want to eat chocolate and biscuits the whole time and drink coffee. So it was sort of funny that they were like, "What? You want you want food? Food?" <laughs> so that was that was an interesting, um, you know, shift of expectations. Um, these are just a couple pieces that I made that evolved while I was um, uh, at the studio um, in the Vermont Studio Center. And I think there's some in work um, that some of these oh, are in different orders, but that's fine. This okay. is more recent. We can just sort of go okay. through them. All right. Um, this was a show that I had at um, Abigail Ogilvy Gallery in Boston in September. Um, so my work has evolved a lot since 2015, just to give you an idea. Um, we can go along. This was at the Kamak Art Center. Oh no, no, this one. This one's at the Vermont Studio Center. Oh, it is. Okay, I wasn't yeah. sure which one's right. Um, yeah, no, that's okay. I should have like. I thought I put the number. No, it's okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so this was at the Vermont Studio Center. So you can see um, the painting on the right um, and the painting on the left. The painting on the left was sort of like how a lot of the, this work started. So it was very abstract. Um, you can see there was nice light in the space. Um, it, it's a pre I mean, the spaces were really um, open and you know big, and even though there were closed doors, people would leave their doors ajar, and so there was a chance to have you know casual conversations. Um, there also were bonfires in the evening, so there was a chance to really just relax and let down your guard. Um, 
Uh, and you know, I think that's important too, to sometimes actually like evolve your work. I mean, you can get into really heated conversations around, you know, depending on what you're doing, that that may end up actually acting as a catalyst. So that's something that you know, absolutely happened for me while I was at the Vermont Student Center. I think this one is France. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. So that looks like okay. So um, the one on the left. Um, this is like a typical setting up for dinner. Um, we have a um, um, Mona is a playwright from Scotland. She's a very successful uh, uh, playwright. Um, there's Gall, and she's uh, a painter who's just graduating from Parsons now. Actually, she ended up going to graduate school there. She just was in spring break art fair, too. Maybe some people saw her work there. Um, and Catherine um, is from Spain, and she does a lot of video and photography. Um, and she's, she sort of goes back and forth between Spain and Portugal. Um, but all of them are working uh, artists uh, full on in their careers. Um, some of them were more like starting out. I know Gal was very frustrated with her environment. She felt that she needed something to shift things, and that's why she decided to take this particular artist residence. Yeah, and there's the set. <laughs> and at one point, people ended up like making a whole boat. There was another. There's, I think there's another. Yeah. Oh, I, I, oh, I was I, I didn't include all of them. Oh yeah, yeah, because there were too many. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's okay. Um, a couple other people that were part of that particular residency. Um, there was a sculptor who did a lot of interactive sculpture from um, who was from Japan. Um, there was a, a poet who was from Australia. I mean, it was a very diverse group. So um, they hosted readings in studio uh, open studios also at the very end of. Um, your stay there. And some writers would stay for two months. So you could get a grant to be able to be there for two months. So one thing that was really lovely about the Kanak location was that one thing that they, they do offer a lot of grants. Um, and, um, and there's also, you know, it's just about a mile to walk to the train station and then you could be in Paris and, yeah, seeing stuff there, talking to people there too as well. And they took us to art openings in different towns and Twa, I think is the name of the town that was closest to this particular one, sort of the main city. And so we went to a few art openings and other things like that that not necessarily would happen at a place like the Vermont Studio Center where everything is all inclusive. Um, so, yeah. Um, and this is a piece that I made at the MFA this last um, uh, winter. Um, it's a um, it's a spiritual object, a menorah. So. Um, and yeah, so that was a sort of like a mini residency while I was there. Okay. okay. I don't know if that's yeah, that it. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Do you want to? Yes, next one. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. However you want. Hi. I I've done four residencies. My first one was at Vermont Studio Center. I had a fellowship then. My second one was in China, and um, I was going through a phase in my life where I just needed something to kind of snap me out of my days. And I had a friend who was in Ch who had done a residency in China, and um, she just said, "Do it." So I applied and got in. And because I knew her, I had a little bit of a comfort level about going by myself and being able to negotiate what I need to negotiate, which that was really kind of stupid to think that because I got myself into a lot of really crazy situations. But then you work yourself out of them and it really was a very rewarding experience. So here, this embroidery over here to the right, the, that is a page from a Mao propaganda magazine from the 1960s. And there were a stack of them tucked in a corner behind a table in the studio I was occupying while I was in China. And um, while I was there, I um, became enamored by some of their craftsmanship um, in, in, in the sort of obsession and single focus and the, and the way their process is. So here, I, and, and I did a rubbing of the window of my studio and, and I, I did a series of embroideries on these Mao pages 
and they were all about my experience and identity and the isolation they felt and things I learned about them while I was over there. This one is a great story because I was a real wise guy and I thought, I'm going to China. Everything we buy is from China. It's been shipped here, so I'm going to buy it here and bring it back. I'll just buy everything over there. So I went with nothing. And I ended, uh, you know, the residency was in this little village, mountain village in the bottom of a mountain. And they really, I learned Chinese population doesn't have a whole lot of access to goods. It's all made for export. So uh, I spent a day looking for a needle and thread, taking buses, going to fabric districts. No one understood what I was saying. They kept leading me to the wrong place. It was really quite comical. But I ended up finding a needle and thread. And, um, but, you know, so then, I, you know, I spent, it was exhausting. And I spent the whole day doing this. A few days later, I needed more materials. I said, damn it, I'm not doing that again. So I went to the local village and I bought women's blouses for material. And, you know, um, I used the foundation of this sculpture is a rice bag that the cook gave me. And I, when I needed to stuff it, I, I just used rice at the time because that's all I had. Um, I, thread was still a challenge, but in this mountain, um, a lot of the industry in China is tucked away where you can't see it. And then they dispose of their leftovers right out in the street. And one of my colleagues was um, on a run and told me he found this huge pile of thread. So I went on a run, <laughs> and I came home with a huge pile of thread, and that's what I used to make this piece. So that's why I love this piece. It's sort of my little talisman of the experience. Then after China, I did this one, and I highly recommend people looking into this, um, a residency at Weir Farm in Connecticut. It's part of the National Parks program. They're free. They're great accommodations, great. Um, this one, I had the caretaker's house from 100 years ago in, on the edge of the woods, and it was all to myself, and I was in an amazing studio, um, and I was free to do anything I wanted. They told me if I wanted to sit and read novels all month, that was fine with them. So it was a really nice experience. When I got there, it was in the middle of a hurricane. Um, and the whole back of the studio is floor to ceiling windows. And you're in the forest area, you know, you're in the woods. So they were just swishing. And it just had an impression on me. So that's where this creature came from, was my, my experience when I first got there. Um, this is a result of time I spent in Thailand. Um, in the residency I went to in Thailand, um, I lived in a mud house created by the founder, who was sort of an art activist, and there were two mud houses, and an artist in each one. And the mud house was sort of like, think of Fred Flintstone, um, kind of looking, and my daughter calls them paper mache houses, because it kind of looks like that. So there isn't much uh, border between the outside and the inside, and being in a tropical area and living near a rural place, um, I shared my space with a lot of very interesting creatures, <laughs> and had to had to come to terms with that very quickly. One of them was a scorpion that lived in my bathroom sink, and every morning would come up and turn around and go back down to let me know she was there. So. Anyway, I made this little one while I was there, because you can see I like to create sort of small sculptures while I'm away. And then when I brought it back, realized it didn't capture the impact of the experience. So I consequently made a 7 foot by 24 foot one out of doilies that I dyed black. So that's where <laughs> this comes from. But it all started, and it ends up being a feminist statement about craft and um, uh, power and resistance, fear, emergence, and all those sorts of things, which led to the rest of the show that just came down at Boston Sculptors. But this inspiration came from a 
my bathroom friend, the scorpion, <laughs> and the centipede, and the grasshoppers, and the snakes, and all that too. But um, you, in the next photo, you'll see this was the one. This is my mud house. I wish I added photos of where I stayed in both places because it was remarkable. What you can add them later. On the, okay, on the that's what I'll do. So this was the one I created out of things I could find. See what I like to do. It kind of happened by accident when I went to China, and I had no supplies with me, and the the experience was so rewarding. And living, I lived with these um, other artists. It was uh, a ceramicist, um, a writer, um, a musician, an installation artist. Um, and we would um, all share all kinds of information. And in both places, I lived with local people. So we had cooks, or um, and we had. Um, like the secretary of the China residency would take me out with her boyfriend at night so that I could see like what life was like in the village. And um, in Thailand, I stayed with Ong, whose family was nearby, and we would eat all our meals together, and they would share all sorts of, so you get a window into a culture, I mean, I'll never really be a part of the culture, but I get a window into seeing um, things that I might not experience if I were totally on my own or with, you know, another American or whatever. So I like going by myself. I like going to strange places. And um, now I like not bringing supplies because it forces me to make do with what I can find around me. And that's great. This is about to. I could talk about it all night long, but um, I think that's it, right? Yeah, yeah that's it. So I work as the visual arts manager at the Umbrella Community Arts Center in Concord, Massachusetts. And I'm in charge of the Artists in Residency program. So I'm going to start with that and information about that organization. And then I'll talk about my experience in a couple residencies as a dance artist. So that is the uh, what once was known as the Emerson Umbrella, if you're familiar with that. Um, so our Artists in Residency program includes a year of uh, studio space and housing. There's actually a little cottage just uh, about a block away from uh, the main building there. That's where all of the studio spaces are. There's a community of about 60 uh, artists working in painting, photography, ceramics, uh, fibers primarily in that building. Um, so that's what the uh, residency program is. Uh, designed to bring someone in who's uh, at sort of the beginning of their career, maybe recently graduated from a program, um, but is really uh, a working artist and looking for sort of a bridge to their next step. That's how it was conceived and uh, it's entering, this will be the fifth year. And if you're interested, we're accepting applications for the next round, uh, the applications are due May 1st. I brought just a little one pager you can take with you, um, and I'm happy to talk with you after about that if you're interested in applying. Um, this year, um, it will be a, a little bit of a shorter residency where uh, it's, I think, 10 months because we're under construction. So uh, we're building a new performing arts center and uh, new classrooms, a new dance studio, and that's one of the exciting parts of the organization is that not only are you in a community of visual artists, but there's this whole community of performing artists and theater programs. Uh, there's a really robust um, arts and environment program being in Concord, really drawing on the history of Thoreau and Emerson. Uh, so there's a lot of sort of outdoor public art events that are happening. Uh, and there's an opportunity to sort of participate and collaborate uh, with those programs as part of the residency. So we are looking for artists who want to do three public programs over the year, and that can really be, um, you know, up to the artist, and we would work with that artist on what that would look like. So in the past, people have done a more traditional talk about their work, uh, free, open to the public, or others have you know, taught a class or a workshop on their particular process that they work in, and we're really open to proposals and, and thinking more and more interdisciplinarily. That's a word, and um, 
so yes, yeah, so that's our current gallery space with the renovation. It'll be um, a new, larger space. Um, but in addition to the public programs, we look for people to create a body of work that then they display um, at the end in some sort of culminating event, which has been a, a gallery showing for some. So our current artist in residence, Elizabeth, um, she is making huge, giant paintings. And I just actually got a photo of her uh, just like 45 minutes ago of her uh, newest work that she created and uh, that's in process for the current residency. And I'll post the information about where you can see her work on display at the Trinity Church in uh, Concord over the summer. Uh, but yeah, she got her MFA at RISD and had graduated and actually was from the area. Um, so she gets to spend time with her family since uh, her family still lives there uh, and splits her time between them and, and the cottage next to the studios. Yeah, so that's a, another one of her pieces uh, called Commiserating, uh, which I, I just love uh, her work. Um, so yeah, I will post uh, the schedule if you're interested in that. And again, please take the, the one pager if you're curious and want to learn more about the program. I just started there a few months ago. You might recognize me from Artisans Asylum, where I was for the prior five years here in Somerville. So um, yeah. Another piece I wanted to share, so um, I'm a dancer choreographer as well and I've participated in a few local residencies and um, I think, yep, that's my dance company, Oregon. You can go check out some of the work and I'll post some of the videos since it's hard to sort of translate dance with images. Um, and yeah, so a little bit about me. I, I studied dance, I went to um, NYU, I was in New York, and then I also studied at uh, the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa for several years. So uh, I came back to Boston after that experience and continued to make dance work, uh, but I really uh, missed this focus on process and feedback and um, being in a, a cohort or a group of people that I had um, you know, in some of my classes where we would meet every week and share our work. And so I think that's why I sought out a residency program because that's, um, you know, where I think I, uh, I, I almost felt sort of lost and I didn't have sort of an anchor. And I think that sort of community that's created in a residency really does settle some things to allow you to, to take risks and make um, new work. But, um, so yeah, I love, some of these photos are actually from a, a performance we got to do supported by the Somerville Arts Council at the uh, Bank of America parking lot in Davis Square. Um, and that was sort of a culmination of, of several um, pieces of work. But uh, so the, I'll actually talk about two residencies that I did, actually both at Green Street Studios in Cambridge um, in Central Square. So. One of them uh, was a uh, choreographer's residency. It was sort of an unlimited access to open space um, that was not used sort of any time during the day for a three month period. And this, the uh, container was that I was uh, invited to use the space, but working just myself. Um, so it was an opportunity to, for me to find my voice and um, try and, you know, just experiment and really pull out the guts, I guess, was what I was invited to do. And I, I think it was, uh, it didn't really go well. I don't, um, and I, I, I bring it up because I, you know, Looking back, I probably wouldn't have taken it had I really thought about the way I work as an artist and the way I thrive, which is working collaboratively in a group. And I think that kind of environment could work very well for people, uh, but it didn't work well for me. So I didn't, um, I, I didn't have a good time. I, I did spend uh, some hours uh, just laying on the floor, staring at the ceiling because I was just forcing myself to 
to go through this process and I'm grateful for it uh, as well. But um, I got to the other residency program was entirely focused on um, building a cohort of uh, other dance artists who would meet. It was over four months and we met um, almost, yeah, about twice a month um, on a Saturday for about four hours together and we would all show the work that we were making and um, get feedback from each other and then also the mentors for the program. So there was a really clear sort of arc of the program. It started very experimentally where we were sharing techniques and um, uh, approaches that we had learned, sort of a peer-to-peer -peer, um, sharing and learning opportunity, but then we had uh, mentors who were very clearly there to give us feedback and had a responsibility to do so um, on a very clear schedule, um, which I found very valuable, the sort of rhythm and commitment to, to showing up and being willing to talk about my work and also show my work. Um, so I think, what's the next? Oh, so this was just a fun, I just dug up uh, the um, flyer from this it sh in showing and works process piece, which was uh, a sort of touch point that was open to the public. So we had this beautiful container where we were um, creating um, awesome stuff, and then we opened it up and sort of got this raw feedback from audience people, which was a great part of the residency, too. Um, and what I think I was able to do with this program, it was um, a significant award of, of studio space, a totally supported um, performance at the end, um, and you can go to the next. Um, so I'm going to, you know, post the video, the final piece we came up with, but um, because I was able to decrease the risk of sort of the investment into this work, in terms of financially the risk of renting all the space and also putting money into a performance and finding a lighting designer and just all of this um, financial investment that prior you know really was about as much as you know we could manage I was able to um, take more risks in artistically um, and I think that's um, what the blessing was that uh, for the first uh, cohort showing, what I did was I did what I normally did, I made work the way I normally do, I just accelerated it just to, rather than approach the arc as like, oh I'm going to make this, I'm going to approach things the way I normally do, I just accelerated that and then let it all fall apart and um, on purpose, like just tore the piece that I had made apart. Um, and so that was exciting, an experience for me and then I was able to invest in um, paying people to, to create the work with me and also um, I got to commission a, a sound designer to make sound uh, custom for that work which I hadn't done before so um, yeah that was uh, sort of the positive of that kind of experience and a different structure where it was a lot more collaborative. That's me. Um, I, I, I'm relating to you a little bit about your um, the dance performing arts in residencies. I wonder how they feel as opposed to visual arts residencies. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to explore that more. But that's, I don't have anything to say about that. <laughs> um, I guess for me, can we see what the next slide is? Okay, that's my bio. It's on my website. Can we see? Is it okay? Oh, this was cool. This was um, my C first CD release, and it was at the Mills Gallery during one of those off weeks, and it was super special. I had a really good time, and the last track, uh, they all have music videos for every song. The last track is in the Mills Gallery during that performance, which was super special, and that is now documented forever until I run out of copies, um, which will never happen. Um, and then, uh, oh, this is uh, um, Mount Auburn Cemetery. I don't know what these are, so is, is this the last one? Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, cool. So anyway, I'll talk about um, what I do. So uh, I've had many different kinds of residencies and in different ways. The most frequent frequent one is being a part of an ensemble, um, and you go to a place and have a week residency where you work on a particular performance or something like that. Um, there's Bindlestiff Family Circus. I did a residency in Hudson with them. Avalok Farms with Mobius Percussion, which is a great place. Um, I think they're only music oriented, but it's a really beautiful space um, where you basically just hang out and you have space to make your stuff. And at night, you all eat, they provide food for you, and you can play for each other if you want. And I thought that was genius because it's, 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 all, it's all about the art. Really, and I think sometimes that, especially maybe in the performing residencies, and you, they start to ask you to maybe do a, or like a teach drumming to the community and stuff like that, and that's really beautiful, um, and I'm not hating on that at all, but when you showed up to make a circus show, <laughs> it, it sometimes can be distracting. Um, that, I know that's all I have to say. What, what are some other... Uh, Diablo Glass, I got to build some um, glass instruments there and that was really special because nobody else there knew what I was trying to do or who I was. Um, and I made some cool instruments and I would always plug them in shows and I think they appreciated that so it was kind of a win-win. Um, I wrote a piece for Doppelganger Dance Collective in Providence and that piece had some of the glass instruments. Um, and now I have a studio at BCA, which is uh, in the artist studio building, which is really special to me. Part of being in the BCA studio has been, it's been a, a little bit more of a long-term situation than I've been presented with in the past. And that's been very helpful, particularly in this time in my career, um, because I have been composing for dance and theater for so long and I realized that um, I hadn't had a lot of space to actually be like, yo, what do I want to make? <laughs> and that's real. It's real as an artist. And, and I think that in approaching residencies and in approaching collaborations, it, you need to feel that inside of you. you. You know, have your gang, have your community, have your aesthetic, have things that you like, things that you're interested in, and be open to collaborating and working with other people, but also like use those ambitions and be excited and, and try to try to make those a reality in the residency because sometimes it feels like you get you have like expectations of other things or you're in a space where you feel like the other artists are working on other stuff and, and you know you have to you want to be in their context and, and that's cool if it feels genuine but sometimes it doesn't and you gotta be true to yourself. Um, so Dance Night <laughs> uh, is this project that we've been working on. Um, I uh, compose music but I also DJ um, and it's been an environment where there can be sort of a DJ party atmosphere, but modern dance can really actually be appreciated and maybe audiences can participate and stuff like that. And we have fun improvisatory scores. Um, and I guess I was trying to talk about this when we first were introducing it ourselves, but since I'm not composing for dance companies and theater companies quite so regularly, I have this Patreon thing, <laughs> where patreoncom music where you can, where I'm actually just exploring like ideas like Dance Night, and and I have a, a little um, kind of radio show uh, podcast where I talk about some of those ideas, and it's okay for them not to flourish into anything necessarily because. You, I don't know, I think artists need to be allowed to do that. Like, artists need to be allowed to try to make something and to, and to have it not be a reality. Or at least, maybe you have a deadline for a show, but that show you're presenting work that could fail, and that's okay. And I think, like, residencies are great opportunities to, to try to do that kind of stuff. Um, 
Yeah. And I think just as a nice little wrap up, if we could go down the line of our lovely amazing panel um, and just share any lingering last minute advice that you have for people applying. If you have any takeaways from your artist residency experiences, either something that was different than what you expected and you could hear their challenges, just any last minute thoughts and or advice would be great. Sure, I'll just, um, I, I feel like I've been sharing my last minute thoughts constantly, uh, but um, <laughs> there's so many of them. Um, but I just want to re reiterate something that I put in my, in my 10 tips, and that's the idea that a residency is a relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think we've heard that like through, through everybody's, everything that everyone has said. You know, when you, from the moment you're applying, you're entering a relationship with the, the organization that's, that's forming their residency, with the jury that's reading your application, with the other people who are there, it's all relationship building. Um, so know that, embrace that, and, and, and then I, I think that you will find a lot of success in any kind of residency, um, because it's just gonna lead to other things. Yeah, um, you know, building that relationship before you even apply, I think is really important. Um, not being afraid to ask, and I think for me, um, you know, being new to managing a residency where someone lives in the place where they also work, um, it actually takes a lot more, you know, sensitivity and um, uh, thinking about how to support this person on my part, and I am, you know, really excited that I have someone who asks and is constantly telling me when things are, um, you know, we're, we just demolished half of the building that we have, and that was disruptive. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, and she wasn't afraid to come to me and really just be frank and candid about that impacting her ability to work, and that's a tough conversation um, because, you know, uh, she felt like the expectations weren't being met, and I think you have to always revisit that um, and uh, be clear and, and unafraid to say, hey, this isn't working, or I need this to change or shift because I'm not able to, to really be myself. It's good for both the artists and the organization. Well, there's a million kinds of residencies like what you all offer, and but the, what I have experienced is um, a situation where I am looking to go and isolate myself from my life to put myself in a new environment and take some risks and face myself in terms of my work. And it's a really scary thing when you put everything behind you and you get in this blank room, you have everything there and there's no excuse not to do work. And then, my goodness, what do I do? And that sort of terror can get you through to another place that's really great. That, and that, I'm not talking about being in a foreign country or anything like that. I'm talking about being like alone with yourself. And that's what I find is really helpful at these um, residencies. And one more thing, I made the best friends. I am friends with someone who I met in China who's now living in Australia. And I'm still in touch with people in Thailand. In fact, one came to visit, happened to be in Rhode Island, came to visit my show at Boston Sculptors two weeks ago. So that was pretty, it met the squirrel. So well, that was pretty special. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I guess I just want to mirror that and like it's fun to meet new people and it's fun to bring people that you already like and just do stuff like that. That's, that's cool. That's it. Um, I, I guess I will like throw in there that you know when you're I guess always the, the challenge for me is figuring out like what I'm gonna put in this package proposal and what kind of images to use if it's you know if it's like a visual kind of um, artist residency. So those are always like the two kind of like main components. Um, and then how do you wanna yeah, how do you wanna present what you do and the possibility or the hints of what you might do in this sort of future state and future space. I mean, I think some of us, I guess the other kind of side thing is that some people being in the environment, the intense environment of the artist residency is going to be a crazy trigger. You're just going to be triggered 24-7. You're not going to be able to think straight. 
because of like comparisons and other stuff. So it can be like a toxic environment for some people. You know, but then I know some people who finish their manuscripts, like in a two week residency, like they just like went to Game Busters and just like were working, you know, 24 seven for two weeks because they were, you know, they were, you know, essentially isolated from daily life, you know, experiences. So that, I think that's, there's, there's something to be said for that. And also the fact that so much of society, you know, disavows what we're doing and the fact that we can be in an environment where everyone is kind of celebrating it, you know, that's, special in itself, so, um, and then it's, it, and it's validating, so you're not thinking, oh yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not fitting into this cookie cutter mold that I'm, is expected of me and I can do these other things. I mean, I know friends of mine who have, you know, um, you know, maybe big families and they're getting pulled and right, left in all different ways, or your jobs and all this other kind of stuff, so it's nice to also just be able to say, you know, a short goodbye to that and be able just to, you know, kind of be selfish and work on just, what you, you know, on the things that you're uh, curious about. Awesome. Well, panelists, thanks again. We could not have had this without you. Thank you to everyone for being here.